There are times when we each need to face the big questions of life. Who am I? Who is God? What is the purpose for my life? Why is there suffering? Many times these questions come when we're facing a crisis or a significant crossroads in our life. Perhaps someone you love is suffering a difficult illness or has died. Or you're starting a new stage in life, going off to college, having your first child, or maybe retiring after a long career. Regardless of where we are in life, even Christians need to be reminded that we are saved by grace and saved by a God who is good. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Reichen, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. We're starting a new series today called The Message of Salvation. Over the weeks to come, we'll be looking at God's answer to the vast problems of humanity. The Message of Salvation, from sin and from death, will be made clear as we see God's plan through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. Today, we'll start at the beginning, Genesis, and learn why we need to be saved. Phil, why these messages, and why now? Well, Mark, when I first preached these messages to my congregation in Philadelphia, it was right at the end of the 20th century. And now, just a few years later, we're living very much in a post-9-11 culture where terrorism and the situation in the world has created even more fear for many people, not only in America, but around the world. I think it's a time when it's even more urgent for Christians to understand the message of salvation and to be better equipped to live it and to share it with others. Allow me to ask the obvious question. Why do we need to be saved? Well, that's a simple question, and it deserves a simple answer. It's because we're sinners. That may sound like a very simple, straightforward answer, but it's one that we really need to remember and to focus on again and again, because we are so tempted to look for the problem somewhere else. Uh, We're tempted to think that we're okay, that we're doing all right. The problem is other people, or it's the government, or it's religious fundamentalists. But if we uh, open our eyes and look around us, if we're really honest about the motives of our own hearts, we'll see that we're part of the problem. And that's crucial because we can't know what the answer is until we know what the problem is. And it's only then that we'll see our need for the Savior. Thank you, Phil. Our first message in this new series starts in Genesis 2, but over the weeks to come, we'll be looking at texts throughout the Scriptures. Let's turn there now and listen to God's Word for us today. Humanity has a problem. And there are signs of this problem everywhere you look in the world. In North Africa, women and children are sold into slavery. In Europe, ethnic tensions produce warfare and even attempted genocide. In the Middle East, terrorist acts are committed in the name of religion. In Asia, millions of little girls are forced into prostitution. And all around the world, people suffer from the greed of the rich and from the violence of the strong and from the cruelty of the proud. And things are not getting better. If anything, things are getting worse for the 20th century has been the bloodiest in human history. One intellectual has rightly described it as the worst century our planet has yet endured. Spectacular advancements in science and technology, obscured by evil, pure, and unadorned. Of course, the new millennium can only promise more of the same, more people, more greed, more lust, and more violence. There's no doubt about it. Humanity has a problem. Or perhaps we should say humanity is the problem. And today we begin a series of sermons about God's answer to the problem of humanity. The sermons present the message of salvation, salvation from sin and from death through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we will show how the only hope for our troubled race is for Jesus to save us, to save us from sin by grace through faith, and all for the glory of God. But understand God's answer to humanity's problem. We need to take the time this morning to understand the problem as clearly as possible. 
And the question that must come first is this. What are human beings for, anyway? For it's only when we know our purpose that we can recognize our problem and begin to seek an answer. Some people say that human beings are for pleasure. This is the view of the hedonist. It was perhaps best expressed by the ancient philosophers who said, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. According to the hedonist, a person is a player. We should live for all of the physical and the sexual and aesthetic pleasure we can get. Others say that a person is not a player but a worker. This is the view of the communist who expresses the value of a human being in economic terms so that our purpose is to be productive. It's also the view of many capitalists, although for the capitalist a person is a consumer as well as a worker. People work for a living so that they can live to shop. And there is the view of the pantheist, who believes that human beings are part of one universal being. It's the view of the Eastern religions. There's no creator, only the creation. And human beings have no separate existence apart from that creation. We're all part of one cosmic, indivisible force. Many others, especially in our own culture, say that human beings are not for anything in particular. We're merely the product of meaningless chance. This is the view of the naturalist. It's often tied to evolution as a philosophy. According to one scientist, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Thus our biology is our destiny We do not have souls, only bodies. A human being is merely another kind of animal, just a trousered ape. One professor has put it even more crassly, a human being is just a machine made out of meat. Now these views about what human beings are for have obviously been greatly simplified, but they represent some of the main options in the world today. Is a human being a player or a worker? A beast or a machine? What is a person meant to be and to become? Well, of course, the best place to learn what human beings are really for is the Bible especially its first several chapters, and I encourage you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Martin Luther described the early part of Genesis as certainly the foundation of the whole of Scripture. And more than that, it is the foundation for understanding God and understanding the world and understanding humanity's place in the world. And thus, it must be the foundation for understanding the message of of salvation. At the beginning of the Bible, we learn that God created the heavens and the earth. So there is a creator as well as a creation, and thus we have already ruled out pantheism, which denies any distinction between the creator and the creature. The climax of this creation comes on the sixth day, when God said, this is The end of chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man. And this rules out naturalism. Human beings are not the random result of meaningless chance. We're the product of intelligent design. God himself breathed life into us, as we learn in chapter 2, to make us living beings, body and soul. And not only that, not only did God make us, but he also made us in his image. This must be of crucial importance. It's mentioned three times in the space of two verses. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him. An image is something made after a model, fashioned according to the pattern of an original And the fact that we are made in God's image gives us an important clue about what human beings are for. You see, who we are is a reflection of who God is. 
We did not make ourselves. We cannot define ourselves. The meaning of our existence comes from God. And so if we ask what a human being is for, the answer is that a human being is for the glory of God. The history of creation reveals that God made us to serve him in every area of life. First, we are to glorify God in our work. This is part of what it means to be made in God's image. For God himself is a worker. We see it in chapter 2, verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. In these verses which follow, he's variously described as a potter who formed the man out of clay and as a farmer who planted a garden in the east in Eden. You see, our work has dignity because we are made in the image of a working God. Our work is not the result of the fall. No, it was part of God's original plan for humanity. So Adam and Eve didn't lounge around all day having picnics. Well, they may have had picnics, but they also had work to do. God told them to subdue the earth, to rule over the animals. He put the man in the garden. This is chapter 2, verse 15. He put the man in the garden to work it and to take care of it. This is why the man needed a suitable helper. He needed help in his work. Adam and Eve together were caretakers. They were the landlords of Eden, the keepers of the paradise zoo. God commanded them to tend the plants and to nurture the animals that he had made. So in the beginning, work was not a curse but a calling. Adam and Eve did not collapse in the grass at the end of the day, too tired to move another muscle nor did they count the days until their next vacation. No, their labor was not a labor, because, you see, they worked for the glory of God and by his appointment. When John Milton wrote his epic poem, Paradise Lost, he depicted Adam and Eve happily and busily at work in the Garden of Eden. In the poem, Adam says to Eve, Man hath his daily work of body or mind appointed which declares his dignity and the regard of heaven on all his ways. You see, work has always been a necessary, even a pleasurable part of what it means to be a human being made in God's image, living for God's glory. Second, human beings are to glorify God with their rest. A person is more than a worker, of course. The problem with communism and, I suppose, with capitalism, as it is often practiced, is that it reduces humanity to a workforce. But human beings are players as well as workers. We were made to follow a pattern of labor and leisure. And, of course, this, too, is part of what it means to be made in God's image. Uh, Reading again in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, and so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. God blessed that day. He made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Six days of labor followed by one day of leisure This is the rhythm of work and rest God established for the creatures made in his image. You see, we do not play simply for our own pleasure. We play in relationship to God, following his example, reflecting his glory. And in the third place, we are to glorify God in our relationships as men and women. God has given us to one another so that our identity as males and females reflects his personality. We read the famous verse, verse chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. This is a statement of the absolute equality of men and women. Male and female, we are all created in God's image. And of course, This is emphasized by the way that God created the woman. He made the woman from the rib of the man so that the female is made of the same stuff as the male. 
This was the first thing that Adam noticed about her. Joyfully bursting into the world's first love poem, he said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Yet although men and women are equal, we are not identical. Male and female, we are created in God's image. And the fact that we're created in two genders shows that we are complementary. We are partners made to correspond to one another. And while Adam could tell right away that Eve was made like him, he could also tell that she was different. She shall be called woman, he said, for she was taken out of man. And this unity and complementarity between Adam and Eve were beautifully expressed in their sexual relationship. The two were united as one flesh. And because their intercourse was a union, it demonstrated their unity. But of course, at the same time, the consummation of their love depended on the differences between them. And thus, their sexual relationship expressed both their unity and their complementarity. The hedonist uses sexuality for his own pleasure. The naturalist reduces it to a mere biological urge. But the man and the woman were made to enjoy sex for the glory of God. Indeed, the very first thing God said to Adam and Eve was, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. So that from the very beginning, the relationship between the man and the woman, even the sexual relationship between them, belonged to God. It was part of his plan for blessing the world. You see, what we learn from creation is that the various activities of human life were never intended to be ends in themselves. We were made to work, but not to be enslaved by work. We were made to play, but not for our own pleasure alone. We were made to have relationships, even to get married and to share sex, but not to gratify ourselves. So that although human beings were made for many things, we have only one primary purpose, and that is to live for God. The most familiar statement of this is still the best comes from the Westminster Shorter Catechism in its first question, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And if you want to know what human beings are for, the answer is that in every area of life, in our work, in our play, in our relationships, in our families, our purpose is to glorify God. So that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, the only way to glorify God perfectly is to obey him absolutely. And to see if the man and the woman would do this, God gave them this test. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Chapter 2, verse 16. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. There was a tree that gave life in the garden, but standing next to it was a tree that threatened death. One tree represented blessing, and the other represented curse. The Bible doesn't call this arrangement a covenant, at least in these verses, but you can see that it amounts to the same thing. For a covenant is a binding relationship between God and man in which God promises to bless his people for obedience and threatens to curse them for disobedience. You can see how the arrangement between God and Adam, sometimes called the covenant of life, had all the features of a biblical covenant. This may explain why in these verses God is given his covenant name, Yahweh, There were two parties to the covenant, God and the man. There was a promise made, a promise of a life of continual happiness in God's beautiful garden signified by the tree of life. There was also a condition stipulated. 
The condition was perfect obedience to the rule of God, summarized just in this one solitary command not to eat of the forbidden fruit. And then there was a curse threatened, death for disobedience. In other words, Adam lived in covenant with God. Now, in and of itself, eating or not eating a piece of fruit is a matter of complete indifference. The only reason it was wrong to eat it was because God said it was wrong. And, of course, to some, this seems arbitrary. But remember that God is the sovereign creator and therefore has the right to demand whatever obedience he pleases. And furthermore, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the perfect test of man's fidelity. For the only thing it demanded of Adam and Eve was the only thing that really mattered, and that was pure obedience. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil forced our first parents to decide whether they would live for God's glory or seek their own glory. They were free to choose. The Bible is quite specific on this point. God said, you are free to eat, but you must not eat. God created human beings with responsibility for their liberty. Augustine described our first parents as able not to sin, able not to sin. John Milton said that they were able to stand, but free to fall. This is because Adam and Eve were positively righteous. Like everything else that God had made, they were created good. And they would have remained good if only they had passed their probation, choosing to live for the glory of God. If Adam and Eve had done that, we would not need the message of salvation. And of course, we do need this message because we do need to be saved. And the reason we need to be saved is because our first parents sinned and thus plunged the human race into loss and ruin. The Bible does not say how long Adam and Eve remained holy and happy, but it does give the impression that their innocence didn't last very long. If you look at your Bible, you can see it only takes a page or two to describe their perfection and then just a few verses to tell how they lost it and then the whole rest of the Bible to explain how to get it back. And we see the chapter on humanity's innocence close with the end of chapter 2 where we read the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Their nakedness was a sign of their innocence, a sign of their intimacy. They had nothing to hide either from God or from one another. And sinners that we are, this is so hard for us to comprehend. People living and working and playing naked. But the Bible adds this explanation so that we understand. And they felt no shame. As we remember our first parents naked in the garden, we sense how vulnerable they were. The next thing we read is that the serpent, chapter 3, verse 1, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Already we sense the danger. There is an enemy in the garden. How he came to be there is another story, but the Bible clearly identifies him as the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. And notice how this enemy begins his attack on humanity. He begins by questioning the covenant. First he called God's command into question. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. In a way, Satan was the world's first Bible critic, casting doubt on God's perfect word. He deliberately misquoted and misrepresented what God had said. God had said nearly the opposite. Far from forbidding the man to eat, he had told him that he was free to eat from every tree in the garden with only one exception. 
And thus Satan turned God's generous invitation into a stingy restriction. He challenged God's goodness, insinuating that God is much more strict than he actually is. And the woman was quick to tell the serpent all of this. She said, we may eat from the trees in the garden, verse 2. But God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, Eve is often criticized for her paraphrase, where she put the words, and you must not touch it, into God's mouth. Still, there was something wise about following that practice, being careful not even to touch the fruit, and in any case, she had not sinned yet by eating it. The real mistake here was trying to reason with the devil. And you can see how clever Satan's response was. Verse 4, you will not surely die, the serpent said, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, having challenged God's goodness, Satan denied God's truthfulness. And it was the most dangerous kind of lie of all. It was an outright lie mixed with a half-truth. You will not surely die. That was a diabolical lie, as the rest of human history has shown. What Satan was really denying here was one of the terms of the covenant. He was saying that it wasn't true that God would bring death for disobeying the covenant. He was denying the threat of mortality. Thus, Satan was the first to deny the reality of divine judgment. And what great evil has come into the world because of believing in that lie. Then the rest of what Satan said was half true, but only half. Your eyes will be opened. Well, that's true enough. Only moments later, their eyes were opened. What Satan didn't tell them, however, was that their eyes would be open to behold their shame. You will be like God, he said, knowing good and evil. And in a way, that was true as well, for eating from the tree did bring firsthand knowledge of evil. But the irony is that Adam and Eve were already like God. They were made in his image. They were like him in every respect that God intended for them to be like him. And furthermore, they already possessed knowledge of the good. They had fellowship with a good creator. They served him in his good creation. There was nothing new that they had to learn about goodness, except perhaps this, how very costly it is to lose goodness. You've had everything to lose from that forbidden fruit, Nothing to gain from it worth gaining. Nevertheless, she stood there gazing at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She was tempted in every way. The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, verse 6, and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. You see, the fruit had a physical appeal. It was tempting to the taste. It had a visual appeal. It was beautiful to behold. It had an intellectual appeal, for it held the promise of forbidden knowledge. And in the end, Eve gave in to temptation. She sinned, and so did Adam. And this deadly deed is described in the most matter-of-fact way at the end of verse 6 in chapter 3. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Those few words contain all the sin and all the misery of humanity. Now, it is crucial to understand that this sin, this fall, was a real historical event. There was a man, Adam, who took a piece of fruit from the woman, Eve, and put it in his mouth, bit it with his teeth, and swallowed it down his throat. And while we can see that much of the language in these early chapters of Genesis is artistic, even on occasion figurative, it is not mythical. The story of creation and the fall is not a fable. 
It is presented as history, and it's treated as history everywhere else in the Bible. For example, Adam is included in the biblical genealogies. It gives not only his lineage, but also the span of his life. When the New Testament explains what Jesus Christ has done in history to make our salvation possible, it is based on what Adam did in history to make our salvation possible necessary. Really, the Bible is the only book in the world that identifies the beginning of evil in the world by showing its origin in a real historical event. Now, there are many ways to describe that first sin. It was clearly a transgression, the overstepping of a boundary. It was a a disobedience, a violation of the express command of God was the breaking of a covenant, the life covenant between God and Adam. It was, as it is often called, a fall, for man had been made upright. And there are also many ways to define that first sin. Augustine said the root of Eve's sin was pride. The Puritan said that you could show that this sin was actually a violation of all or nearly all of God's commandments. It was obviously a theft. It obviously involved coveting, but eating the fruit was a way of having another god, of worshiping the idol of self. The act was based on a lie about God's character and therefore involved both swearing false witness and taking God's name in vain. It meant death for all humanity and therefore it was a kind of murder and so on. There is truth in all those different ways of describing and defining the sin of our first parents. But their sin was also this. It was an attempt to rob God of his glory. You see, Eve was not content to reflect God's glory. She wanted to grab it for herself. She wanted to become God rather than to glorify God. And this is our problem as well. The problem with human beings is our desire to take God's place to live for our own glory rather than for his glory. And you see, this is why we need so badly to be saved. We are sinners who will not, cannot glorify God until he saves us. Now, there are many lessons to be learned from this story of creation and the fall. First, we should remember our purpose, the meaning of our existence, that in every area of life we are made to glorify God. And then with that, we should lament what we have lost. The story of the first sin and the loss of paradise is a disaster of cosmic consequence. We can hardly think of this tragedy without feeling deep sadness for what has become of the human race. Think of the perfect happiness of Adam and Eve in their perfect created holiness. And then think of all the misery and suffering that has come down through the long ages as a result of their sin. When the Scottish minister Thomas Boston preached his famous sermons on the fourfold state of man, he began by preaching about paradise. And at the end of his sermons on that subject, he exhorted his congregation to lament what had been lost. He compared humanity to a beautiful palace now lying in ruins. Here was a stately building, he said. Man carved like a fair palace, but now lying in ashes. Let us stand and look on the ruins and drop a tear. Happy wast thou, O man, who was like unto thee. No pain nor sickness could affect thee. No death could approach thee. No sigh was heard from thee until this bitter fruit was plucked from the forbidden tree. Heaven shone upon thee and earth smiled But now how low is man laid, who was created for dominion and made Lord of the world. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Alas, let us lie down in the dust. And it is good to lament our loss. But there is one saving grace, however. 
And that is that now we know what our problem is. We know, and this is the last thing we should do, we know what our problem is, and now we can begin to look for the answer. The problem with humanity is sin. It is the seeking of our own glory rather than God's glory. And whenever human beings have become convinced of this, convinced of their personal lost and sinful condition, they have cried out to God, what must we do to be saved? And in weeks to come, we will try to give a fuller biblical answer to that question, but the answer is no secret. Now, the message of salvation is that there's nothing you can do to be saved. The only thing that can save you is what God has done through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. And God saves everyone who trusts in Jesus for salvation, salvation from sin, salvation by grace, salvation through faith, and all for the glory of God. And let us pray. Our Father in heaven. We pray that you would give us understanding of the true nature of our condition on this earth. And we pray that we would be convinced of the sadness and the sin of our situation apart from Christ, so that we might come to you for our salvation in his name. And in his name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Every Last Word with Bible teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-488. 1888. Again, that's 1 800 488 1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support of this ministry.